Today I'm going to talk about arthritis and weight loss and I'm going to give you a, a case study of, of a patient um, of mine. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm an orthopedic surgeon uh, and I was seeing a lot of patients uh, who were young, overweight and were coming in for treatment and really what they needed was to lose weight, not have surgery and, and the statement was very much the same. Um, you know, I don't eat much and yet I can't lose weight. And, and for a long time I thought, well, you know, they're lazy, they're cheating, they're having chocolate, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but in fact, it, it turned out that it wasn't right. And, and Paul Mason, um, who many of you will know as a sports medicine physician, was assisting me with my surgery. And he and I decided to go on this journey together. Uh, and I'll, I'll take you through one of our patients. Um, uh, Bob um, is, is the patient I'm going to tell you about. Bob isn't a builder. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take you through the normal paradigm of what would have happened to Bob had he come in, uh, you know, to my practice maybe seven years ago, uh, and, and you know, perhaps an alternative paradigm instead. So Bob's actually a, a plumber. Um, he's 55 years old. He's got he's got three kids. Um, they're aged, you know, 14 to 20. Uh, life and work kind of got very busy for him. He used to play a lot of sports, have, but now he, he kind of works and then he comes home and tends to spend uh, a bit of time with his kids. Uh, he still goes with a group of his friends to a, a, a trainer at least once a week to do some supervised exercise, but he, he finds that he can't run anymore because because his knee's sore. And the, the knee pain has been slowly increasing for many years. So he tells me the pain's mainly on the inside part of his knee. It gets worse with uh, walking and, and digging and some of the plumbing things that he has to do. He tends to get some swelling, some catching. It tends to get worse at the end of the day. And, and if he's had a really big day of, of heavy lifting and on his feet, that night it can wake him up. And so it's becoming a real problem for him because now he's not sleeping well, so his days aren't going well. And at the end of his work day, rather than coming and playing with his kids, what he has to do is come home and rest and put an ice pack on his knee. So this is not a good situation. Bob actually has a great GP. His GP gives him uh, some Pan Panadol, some anti-inflammatory tablets, prescribes physiotherapy for him, and even tries a special brace to uh, unload the arthritis. But because of the shape of Bob's leg, um, he can't, the brace doesn't fit and it rubs and gives him rashes. So, you know, the GP uh, then organises a corticosteroid injection or a cortisone injection, which actually takes away Bob's pain beautifully, but spikes his blood sugars for the next two or three days. So he doesn't want to have another cortisone injection. So he's running out of options now. So the GP then says, okay, look, it's time to go and see the surgeon. So this is a normal knee on the left-hand side, shiny white cartilage, and we see on that x-ray a gap between the bones. The gap is something that doesn't have calcium in it, that's the joint lining cartilage and the meniscus, the rubbery structure in between. Now this is Bob's x-ray, and we see on the inside over here, there's virtually no joint space. The cartilage is wearing out, the shock absorber's going, and he's starting to get the rough, uh, knobbly appearance that you see. Now Bob used to be a fit young man. He played a lot of sports, uh, he ate whatever he wanted to over the years, and despite the same pattern of eating and the same level of exercise, he gradually started to put on some weight. And it only takes one to two kilograms a year of weight gain over a 25 year period to go from the person on the left to the person on your right. Now, you think about what you're eating. Can you control within three grams each day what you're eating? No. But if I'm out by three grams a day in the positive sense over a year, that's a kilogram. Or if I'm out by six grams, that's two kilograms. And so over 25 years, Bob's put on 40, 50 kilos. It's not hard to do when, with just slight missing of your calorie intake. So let's learn a bit more about Bob. This is, you know, I'm a doctor, this is a medical talk, and I have to give you a medical history, so we will go through some of the stuff. He's quite tall at 180 centimetres, but he's 140 kilograms. He's on blood pressure medication. His cholesterol is not so good at 5.9, and his GP's threatening to put him on a statin, but Bob's heard a lot about statins and he doesn't really want to go on one. And Bob's a type 2 diabetic. He's been on metformin for quite some time, and despite the metformin, his blood sugars weren't controlled, so he was put on some insulin as well. Now, Bob doesn't like the feeling of the insulin and really doesn't like to take it. We look at his leg, it's a bit bowed, and we see why on the x-ray. Uh, he's lost some bend and his skin's not particularly healthy. We know that losing weight will help, 
But we also know, well, I know as a surgeon, and most of my surgical colleagues know that when we tell people to go away and lose weight, when they come back three months later, they haven't lost weight. Most of them had tried Weight, weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, Light and Easy, and they can lose a few kilos, maybe five, 10 kilos, but then it all comes back on again for them. So they either then go to, back to their surgeon who says, look, I'm not going to operate while you're this size, and then nobody wins, or they go to another surgeon who does their operation, which isn't great either. But this is the usual paradigm. The usual paradigm is Bob's failed non-operative treatment. He hasn't lost weight, so what do we do to relieve his pain? We do a knee replacement. The problem with that is that lots of things can go wrong. And if you want the actual references for what I'm about to present here, you can see it either on the Low Carb Down Under website with my other YouTube talk or our Low Carb Doctors website, which has all of the references for this. The operation's longer because his leg's bigger and it's a more complicated anaesthetic. He's more likely to get a clot, which can go to his lungs. He's more likely to get an infection. He's more likely to be dissatisfied with his knee after the operation. His movement after the operation will not be as good. He's not likely to go home. He's going to have to go to rehab. He's more likely to get something like a urinary tract infection. Most importantly, from a surgical perspective, he has a five times greater likelihood of needing redo surgery or his component failing within five years. And this should last him 15 to 20 years at least. And if you're a diabetic, all of these complications are worse. So Bob thought it was a bit funny that I asked him to take his shirt off when he came to see me for his knee. But I was looking for signs of insulin resistance. And what did I see? Skin tags, acanthosis nigricans, the darkening around the neck, and a buffalo hump, which are all very classical signs of insulin resistance. So his BMI was 43, not that that matters that much. I arranged Bob to have some blood tests. His H HbA1c was 8. We've heard a lot about that today. We know that his sugar is poorly controlled despite his metformin and his insulin. Now, he doesn't like to run his insulin low because when he's at work during the day, he doesn't want to have a hypo when he's at a work site. So he on purpose keeps his sugars a little bit higher by reducing his insulin. His CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, is high. His liver has some damage, and we've heard about that already today. He's got a fairly bad lipid profile, and he's got some early kidney failure. Again, we've heard about that today. And this is a 55-year-old active gentleman. So we can do fancier tests, and there's a whole lot of them I won't go through. One of the things that most of you will have seen is a, is a lipid profile, which actually gives you the subfractions. And uh, Paul and I have some thoughts about this, and it may not be the absolute numbers that are important, but in fact, the number of bumps. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, a very poor profile with multiple little bumps and peaks. And on the right-hand side, a much better profile where, where there has only one peak. But you'll hear more from uh, Paul tomorrow about that. So let's get back to orthopedic surgery now, because that's what I like to do. The shiny white stuff on the end of your bone is the articular cartilage or joint lining cartilage. It doesn't have a blood supply. It has to last you your whole life. If you damage the stuff, there's no going back. It cannot regenerate. There are no nerve endings in the cartilage, so you won't actually feel pain while you're damaging the cartilage. It's not till it gets down to bone that you'll feel the pain. So on the left, we see young normal cartilage, which is quite white. And you see the thick red layer, which is very good for shock absorption, containing what's called an extracellular matrix and some chondrocyte cells. Then there's the top thin white layer, which are also a different type of chondrocyte, which is very good for lubrication. As we get older, we keep that lubrication layer very nicely, but we lose some of that shock absorptive layer. So if we look a little bit more closely at the articular cartilage, we see the thin lines on the right representing the extra um, cellular matrix, the round dots with the black in the middle being the cells which are vertical in the bottom part and horizontal at the top. Um, this, this layer um, also acts as a filter for the large macromolecules, but so, so there are uh, both uh, um, mechanical and chemical uh, features in this cartilage. It's not just one or the other. So the extracellular matrix is, is actually maintained by the cells. All connective tissue um, have very similar st structure to this. So uh, the cells maintain the matrix and the matrix 
matrix gives the mechanical properties to the tissue. So in this example, we see the cell within, or the, uh, the chondrocyte within the extracellular matrix. So let's talk about arthritis now. So normal cartilage on the left-hand side in an elder person versus degenerative arthritic cartilage on the other side. And what do we see? We see less red, so less of the chondrocytes, less of the extracellular matrix, and that means more pressure goes down to the bone. And what happens to the bone? You get a thickening of the bone, as you see in the green. So less red means more pressure on the bone, and you get much, much thicker stress response in the bone. Now, most people understand that mechanical stresses will cause arthritis. Four times your body weight goes through your knee with each step you take. So if you are overweight, you are overloading your knee by four times with each step you take. But it's not as simple as that because the, the definition of arthritis is damage to your joint lining surfaces, but we need to understand what's happening. So this is relatively normal cartilage on the left-hand side. What I'd like you to notice, as you move from left to right in the middle cell, you start to see little red dots. The little red dots represent AGEs or glycation end products. Okay? And these are, as we know, inflammatory and they damage the protein. We see the colour change with much lighter up the top as we're starting to get some damage to the extracellular matrix. And what's happening? We're getting a lot more of the red dots, but now we're starting to see yellow dots. These yellow dots are matrix metalloproteinases, which I'll explain in a, in a minute. But as we get further and further down, we lose more and more of the normal cartilage, and eventually the whole thing starts to fibrillate. And this really isn't just mechanical destruction because we're getting chemical changes as well. All right, so why would an orthopedic knee surgeon put up pictures of hands? Being obese is associated with elevated risks for an array of chronic diseases, including osteoarthritis. So the onset and progression of arthritis in the hands is associated with body mass index. And that clearly has nothing to do with mechanical loading. So there must be something else happening, creating that hand arthritis. And this is where the metabolic and hormonal come, um, factors come into it. Now, choosing your parents carefully is important because there are large <laughs> genetic components to it as well. But even with bad genetics, you can modify things. And the main factors are the AGEs, the MMPs, leptin, and the mechanical stresses. So let's talk a little bit more about them. The omega-6 is also important, uh, and leptin, as well as you see the high CRP, interleukin-6 and 8, and neutrophils uh, are all important as markers of inflammation, and they all give you an indication of whether the person's likely to end up with arthritis or not. So the matrix metalloproteinases degrade or break down extracellular, the components that are outside the cells, and activate growth factors. So is this always bad? No. If you're pregnant, if you're healing a wound, if you're creating new blood supply to something, this is a fantastic thing to happen. And this is what it's designed to do. But if, if you get too many MMPs, that's when you run into trouble. So what is an enzyme? An enzyme is something that's produced by a living organism which helps speed up biochemical reactions, and that's what the MMPs do. So MMP levels are normally low, MMP activity is normally low, and they're produced in the liver and released into the circulation. But if you start to get liver damage, then you start to release more MMPs, which is where the problem arises. So we've heard a lot about this, so I won't spend much time on it, other than to say that as you glycate your end products, you get damage to the extracellular matrix as well, and this creates problems for you. All right, so just to remind you about the combined effects as a single diagram going from left to right, you get more red dots, more yellow dots, more AGEs, more MMPs, and you get a gradual destruction of this really important joint lining cartilage that you need. And this is not just in the knee, this is in all parts of the body. What about leptin? Leptin should promote weight loss through its effect on food intake and energy expenditure in the hypothalamus. We know that what it's, that's what it's designed to do. But when you get obesity, not only do you have insulin resistance, but you have leptin resistance. Your fat cells are pouring the leptin out, but your body's not responding to it. 
What happens to the leptin? It accumulates everywhere, including in your joints, and leptin damages joint lining cartilage. So insulin and leptin resistance creates a problem for your joints. What about body weight and body fat? So the interesting thing, there was a beautiful study done which showed that if you don't change your body weight, but you shift your body fat from being hepatic and visceral to peripheral, your arthritis pain got better. And that's a lot then to do with the chemicals and the MMPs because the peripheral fat doesn't have the same effect on you as the hepatic fat. And it's probably because of leptin and the MMPs. The last thing that I'd like to talk about is the omega-6 fatty acids. And we all know that omega-6s are bad and omega-3s are good, but we need both of them in all of our cells all the time. The thing to understand is, if you are eating more omega-3s, these two pathways compete for those central enzymes. And if you're producing omega-3s on the right-hand side, there are left, less delta-6 and delta-5 desaturase to work on the left-hand side, and therefore you produce less omega-6s. And so automatically by increasing your omega-3s, you will reduce your omega-6s, but it's much better to also do it by reducing your uh, seed and, and um, uh, vegetable oil intake. So what happened to Bob? Bob embraced this new way of eating. He was excited to get off the insulin and he hated the way it made him feel. So immediately he started the diet, we halved his insulin dose. And we've heard why that might, might be necessary already today. And within six weeks, he was completely off all of his insulin. It suited his lifestyle because he only eat, needed to eat two meals a day. He'd eat breakfast. At the work site, he didn't need to stop in a dirty environment to eat lunch. And he wasn't hungry. So, he just made sure that during the day he kept up his fluids and his salts because he was often working outdoors in the sun sweating. And weight loss was effortless for him. What was somewhat of a problem was his sugar cravings, but he was motivated enough to avoid the knee surgery that he was able to overcome his sugar cravings. So the visceral fat was where he lost weight first. So this is a six month DEXA scan. On the left side you see the yellow around his abdominal organs and liver. And six months later, you see virtually no abdominal fat around the liver and organs. And that's only with a 9% weight loss. And yet by this stage, he had already lost more than 50% of his pain. What happened to his liver? Well, his liver functions went back to normal. What happened to his A1C? Well, it went down to 5.5 off insulin. His CRP, a marker of generalized inflammation, went from 20 down to 1.5. And he had, as I said, a 50% reduction in his pain. It didn't take him long to lose 14 kilograms. It still left him 30 kilograms overweight. But the loss of pain wasn't only because of the weight factor on the knee. It was also because of the reduction in all of his inflammatory factors. So what, what about Bob 12 months later? Well, Bob's still taking metformin, but for other reasons, as we've heard earlier today. He now weighs 95 kilograms. Remember, he was 140 kilograms. Now, not everybody's going to drop this quickly from 140 to 95. It can take 18 months in some patients, but they do progressively increase. But we have had a number of patients, this is not an unusual case, where this has happened. So he's off his insulin, he's off his blood pressure medicines, he's not being threatened by a statin, he's got no regular painkillers being used at all, and as I said, he still takes his metformin. He still has arthritis on his x-ray, but it's not hurting him anymore. If he does have a bit of a sore day, which he does from time to time, he knows how to manage it with some mild tablets, and he can now put the brace on because his leg shape has changed and the brace now fits without rubbing him. And he's definitely not considering knee surgery. So how does LCHF fat loss help your patients? Well, one, reduce blood glucose levels. Less glycation means, uh, it means improved tissue mechanics. Reduced omega-6s helped the bone underneath the joint lining cartilage. Reduced MMPs led to less inflammation. Less inflammation overall has helped his body generally. And he's improved the mechanical loading with the weight loss. So not only has he had the biochemical advantages, he's also had the mechanical advantages. So Bob will eventually need a knee replacement. 
but hopefully for him and other patients like him, they can defer the surgery until much later in their lives, where the prosthesis will last them their whole life, and also they'll be much healthier and less likely to have any complications from their operation. And that's really what motivated Paul and myself to open these metabolic arthritis and weight loss clinics, was to try and help these patients and provide them with a new paradigm rather than, rather than fo following the old paradigm, which really wasn't helping. Thank you.